All right. Thank you, Will. I'd like to have you come back, and uh, we'll spend 30 more minutes together. Uh, just wanted to draw your attention to the back of the little card that you were given with the schedule for today, the list of our coming uh, lecture series, November 3rd. I'd encourage you to just mark your calendar now, and I also would like to encourage you, if you would do this, uh, consider inviting someone to come along. We'd love to see this uh, gathering double in size. I think that the men who do come to us are worthy of that kind of attention. And so if you would, uh, just um, invite somebody and get them to come along. This would be a tremendous blessing to them and I'm sure to us, uh, definitely to us and to our speakers. But November 3rd, Dr. John Fesco is going to be here. Uh, a uh, series of lectures he's entitled Last Things First, and it will be very, very uh, stimulating. Then next year we have in May, May 18th, Dr. Derek Thomas is coming back, and I always look forward to him. And then uh, November 2nd of 2013, Dr. Carl Truman will be back. So mark those dates. Don't let anything get in the way. Invite friends, two or three friends, I'd like to just fill this place uh, for the next one. And then it just is, is a real blessing to the church, I think. Well, Dr. Hart, thank you. And now we'll let you answer all the questions. Sure. Uh, I, I only have five cards. Um, so if you have more questions, don't if you, you may bring them up while you want, or I can always take some from the floor verbally as well. Um, <clears throat> So the first question, here's an, oh, oh, there's, oh, there, oh, okay, well, <laughs> on second thought. Um, people have a lot of different ideas about what the church is. Would you describe what you mean by it? Um, well, there are, um, there are ways of, um, I mean, the, the language of the confession of faith <clears throat> to which I subscribe uh, it uses the language of invisible and visible. So the invisible church is all those saints throughout all the ages who are, are, um, are part of the elect. Um, but then the, the, um, they go on to talk about the visible church, all those people who are members of the church. So this is sort of a way of describing the church as the people whom God has called. In the church, the word church in the Greek, uh, ekklesia means the people who are called, the called out ones. So this is a body of, of, of saints who have been called out by God for salvation. So there's one way of defining the church as the people who God has called. Um, but then also the scripture talks about the church as an instrument of ministry. Um, and so the confession, Westminster Confession, talks about the church having the oracles, the ordinances, all these means of grace. So I think you can talk about the church both as the people of God, but also the people who are called out, but then the church also as a body that, that worships, so has a, an order of, of worship that it follows, that has a body of teaching, as in the confessions and creeds, which summarize what scripture uh, teaches, and also the church as the officers in some way who, who minister in the church. I hope that some gives some clarity. Um, second question is, what do you think about small groups as a means of grace uh, or shepherding a church within a church, as far as house churches? Um, uh, I, personally, um, and I've been part of congregations where this has been also <clears throat> the perspective of the other elders, um, to try to discourage small groups, uh, be, because sometimes they take on lives of their own and they actually become a uh, cliquish, uh, they may become a clique within the church. And there have been some studies of, of small groups that suggest that when a small group collapses when it when it no longer meets that th those people tend to leave the congregation 
Um, so you, you don't want to have that kind of uh, dynamic in it. Um, but, you know, people have Bible, women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies, small groups of that kind. Um, if you're overly anal, the way I tend to be, you want to have an elder always there overseeing, making sure everything is copacetic. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd like to encourage people to be content with the, the regular worship on the Lord's Day, um, other means of fellowship that the, that the larger body may have, but not try to set up, pull groups apart. I think segmenting congregations is, is not necessarily desirable. That's not what small groups are designed to do, but I do think that there's a, there's a part of them that leads in that direction, which is part of the reason for um, myself raising questions about them. Um, I'll, since there are two questions on that card, I'll come back to that one if there's time. Uh, the second one. That doesn't mean that it's a harder question, although it may be. Uh, while a young boy, George Washington made a list of resolutions similar to Jonathan Edwards. Does this give some evidence that he was a genuine believer, seeming to grow in a conversion experience? Um, probably not. It probably indicates, as, as someone else was talking to me afterwards, that, that Ben Franklin also made resolutions. Making resolutions was a common practice among colonial Americans. Um, I think what I was trying to draw attention to in, in Edwards' own resolutions was how all-encompassing those resolutions were, and they seemed to fit his understanding of conversion. And if you if you um, you compare Edwards' resolutions to Ben Franklin's resolutions, they they really are of a different order. So uh, I I admire George Washington in many ways. I'm not persuaded that he was an Orthodox Christian. That doesn't mean that I delight in that in any way. But I don't think. The founding father of the United States uh, was necessarily an Orthodox Christian, um, if that's at all going on. Um, so, next question. Children who grow up under the Isaac model of conversion do not remember their entrance to the church, i.e. their baptism. However, what, do, what they do grow up seeing and remembering is being barred from the Lord's table until they can verbally articulate what the elders want to hear. Are we inadvertently teaching our children an evangelical conversion model by denying them a means of grace until they can obtain a certain level of understanding? Is the sacrament of communion the one means of grace where faith must be accompanied with knowledge before one can receive it? Um, I would say the Lord's Supper is a sacrament where the, the understanding required is not the understanding the presence of Christ or the nature of Christ, Christ's activity in it. If we, and our pastor in my home church in Hillsdale has been uh, leading a, um, a Bible study on, on the sacraments. And I, I'm pretty sure he's, he's right about this, that when Paul talks about discerning the body in, in 1 Corinthians 12. It doesn't mean that your sacramental theology has to be in order for you to partake of the Lord's Supper. So that we're asking a 12-year-old, what do you mean by the Lord's, Lord, by Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper? Or please distinguish your views from the Lutheran view of concept, consubstantiation or something. Um, what, what the body here means, at least in the, directly in, in 1 Corinthians 12, following my pastor here, is that there were there were groups there were factions in the, in the Corinthian church and the way that they observed the supper some not everyone was able to participate or the people who were closer to the table were getting a better share of the goods than others and so there, there was a factionalism in in the church there so recognizing the body means recognizing that this is one meal for everyone and allowing everyone more or less equal access to the elements of of the supper so recognizing the body in that sense is not necessarily referring to Christ's presence in, in the elements, but as much as it is re recognizing Christ's presence in all the believers who are partaking of the Lord's Supper. So that's one way of trying to answer some of this question about the, what level of understanding we, we, we require. But I do think, too, the, um, the, we do require a public profession of faith for partaking of the Lord's Supper, partly based on what Paul says in Romans 10, I think it is, where he talks about if, if those who confess my name publicly or openly, I will also confess them. So it's, it's not so much necessarily a level of understanding, although faith has a level of understanding in it, but it is the ability of someone to stand up and identify with Christ. And, and I do think that that 
is uh, necessary for, um, for understanding whether someone actually is willing to identify with Christ and then they partake of the Lord's Supper, enter into full communion once they have uh, identified with Christ in that way. But I, but I share with whoever the questioner is this, uh, this idea that we may be requiring too high a level of understanding sometimes. I notice in Presbyterian circles, we oftentimes will be much harder on covenant children, asking them questions from the catechism. But an adult convert, well, tell us your story. Great, come on in. Um, and it's weird that we don't say to those people, well, okay, so, um, you know, what is justification? What is adoption? What is sanctification? Okay, well, no, you go study the catechism, come back. Um, so, uh, so there may be something that we need to work out as far as the way that we treat children or adolescents coming to, um, to membership versus adults. Um, next question, I've tended to equate conversion with the new birth. Could you explain the difference? Since all are born dead in sin, how would a parent know that a child had come to saving faith? Um, also, can you explain two kingdom theology? Okay. Um, first question then, uh, the difference between conversion and the new birth. I would, I would identify new birth with regeneration and conversion with that older sense of sanctification, a lifelong process. So the new birth is the beginning of conversion. The new birth is the beginning of sanctification. That would be the difference I would, I would make. Please don't ask me to make sense of this from the Greek New Testament because I couldn't possibly do that. Um, but I do think it's possible to be suspicious of conversion as we understand it today while still affirming the importance of the new birth. But knowing when the new birth happens is a mystery because I'm not sure. I mean, there would be some, some Protestants, Reformed Protestants, who would, who would presume, it's called presumptive regeneration, meaning that they presume that when baptism happens, regeneration has also happened. Um, and so there would be some who would look to baptism as the beginning of regeneration. And I don't, I don't necessarily believe that. I don't know when new birth happens. I think it happens in each person differently. Um, so the second question about king, new two kingdom, I'm not trying to avoid that. Of course, you know, if you follow my blog, I don't avoid that question. But I will try to come back to that. But I'm going with for one question per card at this point. Uh, does Romans 14 negate any observance of the Lord's Day? This is, has to do with Paul's talking about uh, Christian liberty and, um, and, and, and do, putting away with Sabbaths and new moons. Um, and, and the person who asked this question makes a legitimate point that the Sabbath, some would construe the Sabbath of the Old Testament with, um, with a lot of the other holy days of the Israelite church calendar. Um, but if you, I, I think there's a difference though between those holidays that God required for the Israelites and the idea of a Sabbath, which is built into the very structure of creation so that the seventh day is holy in the original creation week, even before there's a fall. So there's something more permanent about that Sabbath day, it seems to me, than, than simply, um, than, than the, some of the holidays of the Old Testament. And, and I think it's that creational, the way in which the Lord's Day points back to Christ's resting from, I mean, God's work, resting from his work of creation, the seventh day, the Sabbath rest that the Israelites would enjoy when entering into uh, the promised land, Christ's coming and re being resurrected from the dead on, on, the seventh, on the first day, so the switch from the seventh to the first and then the eternal rest that we will join the new heavens and new earth. I think there's something bigger going on with the Sabbath and why I think Paul isn't necessarily talking about the Sabbath um, of this kind, of the Lord's Day kind. Now, Paul, and Paul does use the, the language of the Lord's Day, I'm pretty sure, in 1 Corinthians, where he also talks about the Lord's Supper. So I still think there's legitimacy to observing the Lord's Day despite having that proper caution in mind about the doing away of those Old Testament holidays because of the work of Christ. Uh, is there a passage in Scripture where the Sabbath was changed to Sunday? If not, was this practiced from the beginning by the Christian church? Some Seventh-day Sabbatarians claim that the first day is an 
is it aberration? What are your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are only following some of the wisdom I've heard from other ministers. Um, one uh, minister whom I know argued that every time after Christ's resurrection, every time all of his post-resurrection appearances were on the Lord's day, on that, that first day of the week, uh, thus suggesting there's something built in to the significance of that day. And he, would, he even argued that Christ appeared morning and evening, thus suggesting a morning and evening worship service. Now, that may be, may be a reach. Um, but, I, but again, I think also the way that Paul talks about the Lord's Day, I, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians, and also talking about the Lord's Supper. There's something significant about the way that Paul refers to the Lord's X, whatever that is, and that, that achieves a kind of significance. And I think if you wanted to argue for the importance of the Lord's Day, and the first day of the week being that, and the practice of the early Christians meeting on that first day, um, that would be the place to go. But that's as good as this church historian can do. Sorry. Um, do you think modern evangelical, the modern evangelical wing of Protestantism has its roots in fundamentalism more than a confessional tradition, or is it something else? I would actually reverse it and say that evangelical that fundamentalism has its roots in evangelicalism and not in confessionalism. Um, I think evangelicalism basically began d during the first great, great awakening. Um, and, and it's especially the case that this uh, evangelicalism is something that the English-speaking Protestants in America developed. And by the 19th century and the the second great awakening that we associate with Finney, there, all the, the English-speaking Protestant churches are using this evangelical, revivalist, conversionist kind of piety. Um, and then it, they, they continue to go along up until the 1920s, and then they break apart. Um, and one part becomes fundamentalist, one part becomes modernist. And out of the fundamentalists, in the 1940s, there's a group of people called neo-evangelicals or um, progressive fundamentalists, as, as if that, that's not an oxymoron. Um, but, but people like Billy Graham come out of that fundamentalist tradition, and, and they eventually adopt the word evangelical. Um, but I think evangelicalism, in that sense, you could say comes out of fundamentalism, but fundamentalism goes back beyond that to... Whitfield, Finney, and, 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 and that tradition of revivalist Protestantism, um, which, again, I would argue is different from the 16th and 17th century Reformed or Lutheran traditions. Um, next question, how do I effectively communicate the importance of the church to a Christian who doesn't need, see the need to attend? Um, I, I, I don't have... A, a very good answer to that, other than to simply um, pray and 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 try to be an encouragement, uh, ask them to come along without being a, a real nuisance. I mean, I think being a nuisance is not going to help. Um, so some kind of quiet, patient encouragement, unless of course it's a member of your family or or someone over whom you have authority, like a child, then you make them come. Um, <laughs> but. Um, but otherwise, I, I think um, you try to argue for the benefits that are there in the preached word, in, in, the, in, the, in the Lord's Supper and, and in baptism, um, the importance of having the oversight of a um, body of pastors and elders. Um, I mean, I was saying this to someone during the break, but as far as who, whom we will admit to the Lord's Supper and, and the idea is that we admit baptized people who are members in good standing of a Christian church that proclaims the gospel. And, and I don't want to get too provocative about this, but I don't know if someone's a Christian unless they're a member of the church and have been baptized. I mean, it's only their word that I'm taking on this. But it's only, if their word is that they are a Christian, I mean, I guess you could finally make the argument that you need to publicly profess your faith in Christ before the body of believers to be to really be a Christian, um, to to prove it in a way. So, you know that would 
maybe be the way I would try to approach it, but it would depend on um, my relationship with the person, I guess. But prayer would be a very, very good thing. Um, I think you said the, the visible church is the kingdom of Christ. Could you expand on the nature and extent of the kingdom? Um, I, I, th- and this maybe is a way to bring in the two kingdom theology. Um, the, uh, can, you also, can you also explain the two kingdom theology and how that differs with the prevailing view of American evangelicalism today? Um, I do believe that Christ rules over everything, but the two kingdom theology tries to distinguish the rule of Christ redemptively from the rule of Christ creationally. So Christ rules over everything as creator, but Christ rules over his people as redeemer in a special way way. And, and that special way is through the means of grace, through the visible church, through the ministry of the church, through the oversight of the church. And, that, and that's really a fundamental difference, what's at work in, in the two kingdom theology, the difference between the church and the rest of the world, and that Christ rules over the rest of the world, at least in social or political affairs, by appointing magistrates. And so you have a separation of church and state. Magistrates are different. They do their work differently from the work that ministers do. So that's also sort of another wrinkle of the, the, um, the two kingdom theology. But not to be missed is that Christ is Lord over all things. So, so the two kingdom theology isn't trying to deny Christ's lordship over the rest of the world outside the church. It's just that he rules it differently. And to be provocative about that rule is to say that Christ was the Lord of Saddam Hussein. Um, too often, I think that the people who want to affirm the Lordship of Christ only think of the Lordship of Christ as taking place when good things are happening. So if we have a tyrant in the world, well, that can't be an example of the Lordship of Christ because that's bad. Well, Paul says in Romans 13, to submit to the powers that be, to uh, submit to the, the, the officers that God has appointed. And one of the officers that God had appointed in Romans 13 was Nero, who was a tyrant, who was persecuting Christians. Paul says still to submit to them because God has appointed them. So one could even argue that Saddam Hussein was appointed in God's providence to oversee Iraq. So the lordship of Christ doesn't resolve issues about who should be in power and who shouldn't be in power. Um, so again, that may be more than you needed to know, but that's sort of at the heart of two kingdom theology and evangelicalism, I think, wants to assert Christ's lordship over everything and that it's going to work out in certain ways that are, that are pleasing to God. And, and I think there's a certain sense in which that's true. Everything is going to work out according to God's purposes. But at, 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 the, at the middle of God's purposes is this horrendous death of his son, that sometimes bad things happen for good causes. Same thing happened with Joseph going into um, being thrown into the dungeon by his brothers. That turned out to be a good thing. So Saddam Hussein could turn out to be a good thing and not simply the elimination of him. I don't know if that's more than if I've just been rambling, but anyway. That's some of the difference between two kingdom theology theology and evangelicalism, and what the, um, the kingdom of Christ, the church is the kingdom of Christ, again, in a, re- a narrowly redemptive sense, as opposed to this broader creational sense. Um, how did J. Gresson Machen view the thoughts and actions of Abraham Kuyper regarding en- engaging the secular culture? Um, I think Machen regarded Kuyper to the extent that he knew about Kuyper uh, warmly, um, I think Abraham Kuyper was a, a leading Dutch Calvinist, late 19th, early 20th century, um, and most of the Dutch Reformed uh, churches in North America this day look highly upon Abraham Kuyper. He was also not too shabby a figure in the sense he was the Prime Minister of the Netherlands from 1901 to 1905, very important figure in Dutch history and Dutch church history. Um, and Kuiper spoke at Princeton Seminary in 1898, gave the, the Stone Lectures there. Machen would not have been a student there at that point. He came later. So he wouldn't have known a lot about Kuiper, but he would have known enough to respect Kuiper. Machen had a lot of respect for the Dutch Calvinists that he knew in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 
Um, but I have explored their thought more, and I think there were some divergences between them that I don't know that Machen himself would have worked out or thought about. So um, I think only at that time there would have been largely uh, warm thoughts, and there would have been no objections, I think, to Kuiper establishing a Christian university or Kuiper establishing... Well, Machen may have had doubts about establishing a Christian um, labor union or a Christian political party. Um, but only, I can only say may because I don't know that Machen commented on that. Um, how does a person raised in the church without a conversion experience be assured of their faith when doubts come or fight the desire for an experience of conversion? Um, the way I think any person uh, who has doubts about their faith should be reassured in part comes from uh, the ministry of the word on the Lord's Day and, and actually taking to heart when, if the minister, when the minister proclaims the word, trusting in that word, trusting um, in Christ. Uh, the, the, the Lord's Supper, I think, can be a great uh, consolation for those who are doubting. The, the Heidelberg and Belgic Confession both speak about as surely as you touch the bread in your hands and taste the bread or wine in your, your, um, on your mouth, that surely you know that Christ has died for you. So if, if you try to think about observing the Lord's Supper in that way, it could be a, 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 a way of, um, uh, of gaining assurance. But um, it depends on what the specific doubts may be. And if the doubts are whether you believe enough, even, even the faith of a mustard seed can move, move a mountain. I think any small trace of faith is, is stunning and great. Um, but there are going to be seasons where, where doubts are there. I would also say talk to your pastors. That's why God has given us pastors and elders, to talk to them, to, to find ways of, of being reassured in, in your faith. Um, okay. Can an overview of historical role of the church in America, America's war, can you give, sorry, an overview of the historical role of the church in America's war for independence and critique it? or a book recommendation. Um, um, the overview is, is that Calvinists overwhelmingly, Congregationalists and Presbyterians, supported the War for Independence. I believe the king at the time called the War for Independence a Presbyterian War um, because there were so many Presbyterian ministers in support of it. Of course, the only sign of the Declaration of Independence was a Presbyterian minister, John Witherspoon. Um, and I think a lot of this goes back, though, to 17th century British politics and the ways in which both Puritans and Presbyterians were uh, treated by the monarchy and the parliament in the 17th century. Um, the book recommendation f on the war for independence and the role of the church, um, Mark Knoll is, is a good source to go to for most things, um, but his, his dissertation was on... Uh, on f four different approaches to the war for independence. And I don't know if it's in print anymore, but if you can find anything by Mark Knoll on, on the revolutionary era, that would be useful. Mark Knoll, prominent historian for many years at Wheaton College, now at University of Notre Dame. Uh, an elder in the OPC for a time, now, um, now a member of the um, Christian Reformed Church in South Bend, Indiana. Um, was revivalism responsible for the proliferation of cults and holiness groups of the 19th century? I would say the short answer is no. Revivalism was not. Uh, political liberty probably had a lot more to do with the, the, um, the proliferation of cults and holiness. When you no longer have a government contr control of religion, which we did not have in the United States, anybody can set up any church they want to. And that's going to... that's. Part of the reason why America is as vibrant with religion as it is, because it's something that anybody can do whenever they want. When it's regulated, like it, what, like it still is in England with an established church, you eventually only have so many options. And the analogy here is back in, back in the day when the BBC was the only option for British television, there were only four channels. But with political liberty comes cable vision, and you get 500 channels. And that's what happens with liberty in America. You have three churches, and now you have 500 churches, conceivably. Um, 
I hope that helps to answer it. What is the modern gospel that is being preached in America? Lacking. Well, say, okay, sorry. What is the modern gospel that is being preached in America lacking? Um, I would just refer you to Mike Horton's book, Christless Christianity. Is that what it's called, I think? It's so, sometimes it's lacking Christ. Joel Osteen would probably be the best example of this, most visible example of this. You can probably find it other other examples. Um, but what Christ has done and how much we need him for salvation, especially for forgiveness of sins, that would be a big part of what is missing. But I recommend Mike Horton's book to you, whoever asked that question, and to anyone else. Um, on the back of your book from Billy Graham to Sarah Palin, it is mentioned to attend to the Federalist Papers as much as to Scripture. Um, haven't read the book, but welcome your brief comment about why, I, I guess why I would say I recommend the Federalist Papers as much as Scripture. Um, again, that was to be provocative, in case you didn't get that. Um, the, um, the reason for saying that is to understand the American polity. It would, you can't, you go to the pages of scripture, you're not going to find anything about federalism. You're not going to find anything about states' rights. You're not going to find anything about republics and what republics are as opposed to monarchies. Um, but if you go to the Federalist Papers, you're going to see a lot of very intelligent debates about the differences between a city-state, a republic, a federal government, what the role of the states should be in the new United States of America. All of those questions are very relevant for American politics, at least until 1880, I would still argue to this day because there's still a lot of back and forth between Washington and the various state governments. So that's all I meant to say is that you're not going to find out about the, the actual contours of the American polity, republicanism, federalism, in scripture, but you are going to find out a lot more about that in the Federalist Papers. I don't think that's too um, objectionable. Okay, uh, two more questions. What You've been accused of being anti-pietistic, hence the pietists have added nothing to society. How do you answer your critics? Um, I am probably anti-pietistic, and it's having been a part of too many small groups <laughs> growing up. <laughs> um, and I, just the, the thought that pops into my head, one of the, these is small group prayer. I've always wondered about this, um, and may, maybe you know, maybe this is again too much information, and maybe your experience, maybe you're just so much more devout than I am. But when I was a kid, sitting in small group prayer, and we would have all the prayer requests, and we would all, you know, and then we'd all sort of just have a, a free form prayer, and who would who would choose, you know, people would just pray as they felt led, and so you know, while someone else is praying, I'm composing my prayer in my head because I don't want to sound stupid. So, but I'm not praying with that person. So you're kind of defeating the point there. But then that person takes what you were just going to pray for. Darn it. Um, it just, it's just kind of, so it's, it's some of the anomalies of pietism that drove me nuts as a kid um, that, uh, that, that may inform this perspective. Um, but I wouldn't, <laughs> hence, I, I don't, I'm not sure, entirely sure what this phrase means. Hence, the pietists have added nothing to society. Um, I, I, I do think, I am critical of the ways in which evangelicals have engaged in politics um, in America. And, and I think it reflects a certain pietistic strain, which leads to a kind of moralism, which, um, not to say that I'm for immorality in any way, but I think there are maybe better ways of pursuing that morality sometimes. So. Yes, I am anti-pietistic, I guess, and I wouldn't say they've added nothing to society, but I wish they, were, they would be more cautious. And the way I'd respond to my critics is to say, I guess, guilty as charged. Okay. Um, uh, and then what, it, what do you make of all the dire predictions concerning the church as institute in America in the 21st century that we do not need it... in a internet age, I think that is. Um, I, I, there's, there's, in my estimation, there's no way the internet can compete with um, the, the physical presence of saints gathered, the physical presence of pastors and elders with saints meeting either at church or in their homes. Um, there's nothing that can, and it, it's not always pleasant. Don't get me wrong. Being a member of a body of believers means that you're now 
part of a body that has some odd people in it. And, and, and that's, that's what makes belonging to human groups human. Um, but the internet, there's no way that the internet can make up for that. And if you only are, are, are doing church by internet, you are, you are prone to your own problems will just become much more of a problem. You are going to filter everything through your own perspective. And we need other people, especially those who may have some responsibility for us, to keep us in check. Um, and so to interact with other saints personally, to be a member of a body, is, is a great way of saving us from ourselves. Um, and I mean, I think the internet is amazing. I think it's, it's a remarkable feature of modern life, but there's no way that I, aside from the, just the theological reason that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, nor will the wires of in, the internet prevail against the church, um, I have to say that I believe that because I believe that's what scripture teaches, but I also believe that there's no way that the internet can actually do what the church does, uh, what, a, what a body of believers in a particular place does for each other. So I don't, I don't think those predictions are, um, are all that substantial. So, okay, I guess that's it. Well, thank you very, very much. Well, this will give you, uh, give all of us food for thought, and we can go away and uh, think about uh, what we've been taught today. And it's just been a delightful time, a very helpful time. Why don't you stand with me, and we'll pray, let you go. Thank you again for spending these hours with us. Um, also, those who attend Cornerstone, Dr. Hart will be with us tomorrow morning. I invite you to come and enjoy the service and worship together. Heavenly Father, thank you again for our day, for what we've learned, how you've instructed us. We thank you for Dr. Hart and ask that you would continue to bless him and his ministry and his work. And Lord, just keep us, keep us safe. May we grow in faith. May we gather again at our home churches tomorrow just to worship and to be in your presence with other believers. So we commit ourselves into your care. May you be honored in all that we do in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. You can certainly come and greet Dr. Hart if you'd like.